but let's let's get to the science of it. So I'm going to describe an analysis of the data that um, that Dan described, which involves a collection of uh, essentially uh, life history, uh, event history information from the subjects, uh, the subjects, usually the subjects caregivers about what uh, actually happened in the pathway from their first concern of that their child may have autism to a diagnosis of autism. And I'll, I'll try to quickly take you through the rationale for why that became uh, uh, very important and resulted in a publication which you'll see that just came out this month in the journal Pediatrics with this title and this authorship group. And, uh, and uh, we'll have the references there for you. And, and these slides are also uh, certainly available. The background to this is that um, for a number of years now, the Centers for Disease Control has been monitoring the prevalence of autism. And to make a very long story short about the prevalence of autism and its diagnosis in the community, historically, the identification of autism was um, essentially underrepresented in uh, minority uh, families. And so there were lower quote unquote rates, although nobody ever believed that autism was less common in black or Hispanic uh, uh, families. And so um, uh, in recent years in that surveillance program, uh, and in some ways a credit to you know, community diagnosis and the, and the process of that over time, that, um, that those rates have essentially equalized now. And, and it used to be thought that for underrepresented minorities, when a case was diagnosed in the community, it must have been a worse case or a, a more severe case on average because only the severe cases got identified and the less severe cases didn't. But the point of this first slide is to first tell you that that's all changed, that since the, the 2018 and 2020 surveillance years, for the CDC's uh, program, uh, uh, Autism and Developmental Disabilities Monitoring Network Program, that essentially the uh, rate of community diagnosis for autism has equaled across race. So that's good. That's a good thing. That that essentially that you know for for all the different groups uh, of our population, different diversity, that the kids that have autism uh, are getting identified apples to apples using our current uh, definitions. And, and they're getting diagnosed by clinicians or, or by schools recognized uh, of kids in the classroom. But the problem is, is that when that equalization occurred, what we were left with was a different kind of disparity for minority families, most pronounced for black families which was that the rate of comorbid intellectual disability, if you were an individual with autism, that the, the percentage, the likelihood that you, your condition was also complicated by intellectual disability was essentially 20 to 30% higher than for white non-Hispanic children. So this is a, a monumental health disparity in the sense that, you know, there, there, there are factors that may relate to some uh, adjustments of the, the ascertainment, but, but by and large, what's happening is that, and what we've learned about these children who have been ascertained either through schools or, or, or community diagnosis by clinicians, that if you're black and have autism, that the likelihood is significantly higher that you will have comorbid intellectual disability with that. And so we were very concerned about that, especially as it related to other known disparities for uh, minority children with autism spectrum disorder, specifically that they tended to get diagnosed later and they tended to have much poorer access to services once they were diagnosed. And all of that has sort of come to roost and is true and has been recapitulated in this data that uh, which of course was collected for a study of genetic diversity and making sure that we ensured uh, human representation in genetic studies in autism, but now has become a pathway for us to document uh, what is and is not a factor in producing this kind of disparity. 
So uh, this uh, is a summary of those findings, and it involves 517 families from the sample that uh, Dan uh, described, in whom we uh, recapitulated pretty much what the Centers for Disease Control found. Um, not quite as high in our uh, 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 research recruitment sample, but pretty close to that uh, elevated level uh, for African Americans that was identified by the CDC. And uh, a quick note that the mean age of diagnosis for these 517 children or individuals with autism in these 517 families uh, is uh, 64 months of age. So uh, again, over five years old was the earliest, uh, the first uh, age of diagnosis for uh, these particular families. And the slides are gonna have some more details. I don't wanna get too distracted for the purpose of time and I wanna give opportunity for any questions that uh, might burning questions that may come up. So I'm gonna skip through this, but again, if we can make the slides available uh, later and, and to, and, and all, of, all of this information is actually in this uh, publication in pediatrics from, uh, from this month's issue. So, um, so as Dan said, the 517 families also, just to recognize that uh, the ancestry, the African-American kind of ancestry that we were uh, exploring as, a, as a, a parameter of the description of this sample is something that was not only self-reported, but backed up by uh, molecular genetic confirmation. And as Dan mentioned, we con conducted an event history calendar interview for all of these families, meaning that we wanted to know the, uh, the, the process of the first concerns and help seeking experiences of the families, their demographics, when the child children were diagnosed, when they received services, what kind of interventions uh, occurred when that happened and overall appraisal of that odyssey for the families. And the most you know, striking findings were that the families really had identified first concerns of their uh, children on average by the time they were 29 months of age. So just less than two and a half years old. But the mean age of an actual receiving an actual autism diagnosis was over five years of age. So a 42 month delay in an actual diagnosis. Um, almost all of the families had a doctor almost all had insurance, almost all had healthcare providers. And um, there was a mix of public and private insurance and all this. And many of the families before receiving an autism diagnosis had made multiple visits to various professionals before that was rendered and then therefore made their children eligibility for service. When we look at the correlates of the outcomes of these children. So you take the whole group and you say there was on average a 42 month delay between the time of the parent's concerns about a developmental delay and a diagnosis that would make them eligible for autism specific services, that that means that there was a window of opportunity perhaps to change what happened in terms of the outcome or to address this disproportionality in their uh, cognitive outcomes. And one of the things that we were very glad to have in this particular study was information about the usual correlates of lower IQ in families that we could either invoke or in, in, in essence explain away that this was not really what was happening. So often the IQ um, uh, scores and the cognitive abilities of parents and family members are potentially causes of lower cognitive ability in a given case if they are, let's say, co-inheriting aspects of the syndrome that would take down some of the uh, cognitive uh, functioning uh, uh, of not only the index case, but uh, family members that may have also inherited risk for uh, autistic syndromes that were not, whether were subclinical or that might have cognitive impairment associated with them. We looked at those family members and saw essentially no correlation or no association between familial genetic liability for cognitive variation and the cognitive outcomes of these children, who again, were disproportionately affected by intellectual disability in our sample, just like they were in the epidemiologic data from the United States. And so we looked at 
other factors that may have explained that. It's always been known that earlier age of diagnosis is often associated with more severe syndromes. And so there's some ways in which the, some of the more severe kids are going to get identified earlier. But when we looked at other factors, such as um, the uh, uh, quantitative autistic trait burden of the children, parents' IQ, family income, mother's education level, most of those had a very low level of correlation with the children's IQ and would not account for this disproportionality in the children's cognitive outcomes. And so the overarching result is that, again, there was this 42-month delay that the relationship between timing of diagnosis and ASD severity is always complex, but ID comorbidity, intellectual disability, formerly mental retardation, called mental retardation comorbidity, was not predicted in a straightforward manner by family factors that have typically been associated with cognitive variation in the general population, and that these findings then document a great opportunity. What if we were to expedite diagnosis? What if we were to uh, uh, avail children to the actual interventions that may offset uh, those cognitive disability outcomes that we could resolve this uh, disparity which, you know, there's a lot of health disparities by race in this country. But if you think about the disparity of a doubling of the rate of a lifelong condition of intellectual disability, um, which, which translates into hundreds of thousands of excess cases of uh, intellectual disability in the US population just on the basis of race in relation to autism, um, we need to capitalize on this opportunity just because of the magnitude of that impact. There was uh, some nice uh, press uh, coverage of uh, these uh, results. And I wanna point out to the group on the call today that when we think about autism specific interventions, especially, especially for younger children within this age range, which in, literally within this 42 month window, that the largest open trials of the effects of early intensive behavioral intervention have shown, um, based on the intensity and duration of those services, substantial improvements in social adaptive behavior, play behavior, language, cognitive function, okay, okay, you know, measured in these particular studies and various aspects of adaptive functioning. Our colleagues around the country have also identified that issues in delayed screening, issues in the um, uh, inequitable uh, uh, availability of services have imposed structural obstacles to not only diagnosis, but the acquisition of appropriate service for these children. And that we have a, a clear and present opportunity based on the parents' own recognition of when their children are delayed that we could come in and try to level the playing field, which right now is not a level playing field for minority children in our country. And so we were very happy that accompanying the article was an editorial that was written by, I think, very courageous authors who came out and said, the interpretation of this, or one you know, pressing interpretation of this is that until proven otherwise, that this is a sort of scientific representation of structural racism within autism. And so I won't go through all the points made in this editorial, but I'll, I, but I'll, but I'll recommend it to everyone and the references here. And, and, and it is a, a sort of throwing down of the gauntlet. The question is, do we as an ASD clinical and research community have the will to achieve the goal of leveling this playing field? The authors articulate that a robust response to some of these issues would be evaluating Medicaid reimbursement, removing restrictions to who's qualified to make a, a diagnosis, increasing adherence to evidence-based practices in terms of getting not only screening and diagnosis, but actual delivery of care, increasing workforce cultural humility, which is part of this national conversation on race, of course, and recruiting a worse workforce that reflects currently doesn't, but that should reflect the diverse communities that are, that are served. And so, um, so our path for this project that Dan described moving forward is that in the cohort that we are current, currently collecting, which includes toddlers, 
uh, uh, minority toddlers in this data collection. We want to identify as early as possible these children, refer them for intervention services, support their parents to acquire what their children are actually eligible for, and then provide services when the community can't provide them, which is common. There are so many obstacles for minority families who are uh, disproportionately in socioeconomic and, and, and geographic and community circumstances where they don't get access to what the other kids actually get. And so we have enrolled in our program now, uh, in, in this genetics program, 57 African-American toddlers with autism, most of whom have AS, uh, are toddlers who were suspected, whose parents suspected of having, them, of having autism. And 82% of the time, the parents were right. And for most of the time, the research program is their first diagnosis. And so far, our mean age of diagnosis has dropped from the national average of uh, 67 uh, or 64 months to 27 months. We can actually make this, uh, this opportunity happen. We, when we originally recruited this sample, on average, they had less than two hours a week of intervention. And remember, intensity and duration of intervention is what predicts these better outcomes. Pre-COVID, our average just in three months of getting these kids these additional services when the community couldn't provide them, we had our average of our whole group up to 4.3 hours per week. COVID hit, and I'm sad to say that we're back down to 1.2 hours per week, but we're going to rise. And what I hope and recommend is that communities everywhere will try to do this and take a page out of this playbook, not just in a research study, but to level the playing field. So I'm gonna stop there. Um, and I don't know if there's time left for questions. 